So I remember when I was in seminary, there was a student whose car was always parked in the same place between the bookstore where I worked and the lecture hall. And when I would pass by this car, my eyes would fall on the lone bumper sticker fixed to the rear of that vehicle. And the bumper sticker said, end obfuscation. End obfuscation. And it seemed like a clever thought to me, though like most people I wondered, what's obfuscation? <laughs> so I looked it up and I learned that obfuscation means the action of making something obscure, unclear, or unintelligible. And now I found the bumper sticker to be even more clever because now I caught the irony. Because what could be more obfuscating than the word obfuscation? I grew up in a very obfuscating expression of Christianity. I was taught that God was love, but we were always angry at people. I was taught that we were to humbly serve others, but we were always self-righteously putting other people down to make ourselves feel better. I was taught to sing red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in God's sight. But we were always treating immigrants and people of color with suspicion and as second-class citizens. And perhaps most confusing of all, I was taught that the Bible was to be our supreme source for the knowledge of God. And yet, we were always drawing the strangest ideas from it and asking really poor questions about what the text meant. It took me a long time not only to perceive all of this dissonance, but it also took some time to draw connections between what I read in the Bible and what I was taught was good Christian living. Recently, an image went viral in progressive Christian social media circles, and the image shows a classical picture of Jesus on one side, you know, European Jesus with the Socrates robe and such. And then to the other side of the picture, there was a snippet of a conservative Christian college's code of conduct. And that selection states, you know what I'm talking about says this, clothing is inappropriate when it is sleeveless, revealing, or form-fitting. Hairstyles should be clean and neat and trimmed above the collar, leaving the ear uncovered. Sideburns should not extend below the earlobe or onto the cheek. Men are expected to be clean-shaven. Beards are not acceptable. Earrings and other body piercing are not acceptable. Shoes should be worn in public campus areas. And so you read this code of conduct, and then you look over to Jesus. And Jesus literally violates every piece of the code of conduct. I mean, sleeveless robe revealing part of his chest, check. Long hair covering his ears way below the collar, check. Sideburns, beard, sandals, check, check, check. And of course, the nail-pierced hands are not exactly body piercings. It's a bit tongue-in-cheek, but we get the point, right? How did Christianity come to this? And maybe you feel far removed from that expression of religion, but for me, I grew up in this brand of Christianity. We were teetotaling. I had a professor who wouldn't even buy root beer that came in a glass bottle because he thought that someone might see him and, and he would cause them to stumble. For us, rock and roll was the devil's music. Even contemporary Christian music was despised because it blended Christian words with satanic rhythms. I went to a Bible college where we were policed very closely. Boys and girls had separate elevators and couldn't touch, even shake hands. That's an appropriate response. <laughs> you had to ask permission to leave campus. Lights out at 11 p.m. 
a demerit system for discipline. I kid you not when I say Liberty University was liberal compared to us. And it's just another example, right? Of how people sometimes take an otherwise simple faith and freight it with all kinds of add-ons. As though the simplicity of love is some kind of scam. Some kind of bait and switch that God is trying to pull over against us. Like, there's got to be more to it. And then when these simple principles are substituted for these add-ons to faith, we sometimes go so far as to complete the exchange. And then the spirit and substance of faith gets lost and it's replaced with these just symbolic performances, as though they can be worthy surrogates for real devotion. In our passage for today, Jesus is struggling against the obfuscations that have mired his Jewish faith. And he laments angrily over the complications that constrain belief in this gospel message. He asks, to what will I compare this generation or this society or culture? And he suggests that they are like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. Scholars think that Jesus might be referencing a children's game or perhaps a playful kind of song. But whatever the case, the message has been delivered in different ways, and it is still ignored and rejected. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. And as we read in the text, the saying refers to the ascetic austerity of John the Baptist, living out in the desert, like a monastic of his Jewish profession. On the one hand, there is John, but on the other hand, there's Jesus' more convivial, let's call it partying with the outcasts, kind of approach. And the point again is, however the message of God's kingdom is delivered or packaged, the message falls on unwelcoming ears. And so Jesus, in the style of a Hebrew prophet, denounces this faithlessness, this inhospitality, he calls out the towns of Chorazin and Bethsaida, both cities in the Galilee region, which are known for having a somewhat mixed population of Jews and Gentiles, Jews and non-Jews. And for this reason, it's believed that some, but believed by some, that the Jewish population in these cities thought themselves to be more cosmo cosmopolitan and enlightened than those religious fanatics and zealots further south near Jerusalem. And so Jesus compares them to the more cosmopolitan, more diverse cities of Tyre and Sidon. These were coastal cities in the north, in Roman Syria. And he says that if the deeds of power had been witnessed in these more cosmopolitan cities, they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes. But you have not. Jesus even compares Chorazin and Bethsaida to Sodom, which we know is not a reference to homosexuality, but to unwelcome, to inhospitality, to a failure despite one's resources to offer an appropriate welcome. And then Jesus goes on to thank God for revealing his message to children, but hiding it from the wise and intelligent. And I wish we had more time to delve into this statement, but I'm afraid it would take us further afield then we, can, we have time to go um, this morning, but suffice it to say for now that there is an elegance and power to simple truth. An elegance and power that intricate and complex misinformation can never possess. But what I'd like to focus on this morning is that last paragraph. Come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. To understand these sayings, we have to return both to the agrarian context and the Jewish background. 
the yoke, in case it isn't a clear reference, it refers to that farming tool that pairs oxen together, the heavy wooden bar that keeps the two plowing in the same direction. Now the yoke stood as a symbol for covenant. The Apostle Paul uses the metaphor to describe a marriage covenant in 1 Corinthians, of two being yoked together. And though, and, and through Judaism, the, throughout Judaism, the yoke is used to describe the covenant between Israel and God through the keeping of the Torah. And by extension, the covenant that a disciple made with his rabbi or teacher was a yoke in learning his way of interpreting and practicing Torah. In other words, to take on the rabbi's yoke was to learn Torah from him. And so Jesus says, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. The Judaism of Jesus' day was in many ways and in many places an obfuscating religion. And we see in the very next passage, which we didn't read today, how Jesus and his disciples are taken to task by the religious elites for plucking grain on the Sabbath. Major no-no in this culture. And the easy yoke passage is a precursor to this episode in Matthew's Gospel. Now I do want to be careful here because there is a nearly 2,000 year old argument that Christians have leveled against our Jewish neighbors. That Christians have often characterized Judaism as a religion of rules and works of rituals and worry over trifling matters. But for those who actually know the Jewish religion, nothing could be further from the truth. If we actually did some digging, we could find out that the Torah observance of Jesus' day that was meticulous and perhaps overly scrupulous to us was itself a response to generational trauma following the Jewish exile in Babylon. This drove the Torah observance that we find in pockets in the Gospels. But we should also recognize that this obfuscating religion can infect any faith and any religious expression. This is sometimes experienced in Catholicism, where works overshadow spirit. But many of us know that that doesn't need to be the case. We Protestants also have our sacred cows. Sometimes we can point to liturgy and the rigidity of our ways of doing things as examples of how we can miss the spirit because of some symbols. Case in point, it's really hot up here and I would like to take this robe off. Because liturgical propriety is, it's, it's good for storytelling, but you know, there are more important things, right? Right. Like mercy. <laughs> <laughs> we can point to the ways that we progressives talk about language. It's a great thing to be able to know how to speak hospitably to marginalized and oppressed groups. It's important. But I worry that sometimes we so police language that we forget that not everybody is in the same place that we are. And perhaps we were once in that place. You know, what, what is the saying again, UCC? No matter where you are, who you are, where you are on life's journey. It's beautiful. We can have signs that say all are welcome, open and affirming, Black Lives Matter, 
Brown lives matter. Indigenous lives matter. But without substance, I think you'd agree, it's false advertising. So as I made my own evolution through the ranks of fundamentalism into the world of evangelicalism, because for me that was a very clear leap, I started to look for a new seminary to attend. And I went to interview at a nearby seminary that was, at least for me at the time, more progressive. And I sat down with an, admi ad an admissions counselor. Normally, an admissions counselor would say, so why do you want to come here? She asked the same question, not in the same way. So why do you want to come here? Well, I told her. I'm outgrowing the faith expression of the seminary that I'm going to. I don't want my theology defined by what I don't know. I really want to learn the perspectives that this school can provide me. So, I'm looking at your schools, this undergrad Bible college, this evangelical seminary. I have a responsibility to protect the sheep from the wolves. I continued. She had degrees. She's gone on to write books. But when I showed up to her door, open, wanting to learn more, it was slammed shut because of who I had been, not who I was or who I wanted to be. And as we consider the easy yoke, the simple truths, let me caution against one more problem. When I was a child, my curiosity was not honored. I asked questions, meddlesome questions, questions that were ignored or offered canned answers. I was considered rebellious. That's funny. Maybe I care enough to ask these questions. And that story played out over and over. When I looked at the Bible, I saw something that went beyond simplicity. When I look at nature, I look at the stars, I look at DNA, the human body, I look at a leaf, mushrooms, you name it, I don't see just simplicity. There's enormous complexity. I look at life, I see complexity and paradox and mystery. There is more than what is simple. There are more truths than what we can call easy. But what I think Jesus is trying to say here is that simple truths are available. Simple truths are always there. And it's not good enough to have a Peter Pan faith where you never want to grow up. But it is easy enough that a child can understand. And you grow from there. I think what Jesus is trying to offer us is a break. It's okay. Maybe the desk of your mind is cluttered. Maybe your heart is heavy with all of the trying to figure out what 
does it look like to live justly and love mercy and walk humbly? Maybe we don't understand the intricacies of the Bible or of the church or of the complexities of the political and social situations that surround us. You don't have to figure it out right now. Maybe ever. All you have to do is come back to what you know. And so, one of the 12 parts of the rule of life that I live in covenant with my Richmond Hill community is simplicity. I do struggle with that one. I do. Because the fact is, I love complexity. Sit me down with a published dissertation and some beer, and I'm a happy camper. You know, throw me into a Society of Biblical Literature or American Academy of Religion meeting, and I'm like a kid in a candy store, just listening to papers. Bring it. But when it's heavy, too heavy, let's hope we can tell the truth and admit when it's that heavy. I just need to sit down, unclutter the desk, and come back to the simple truths. Amen. What does love require of me in this moment? What have I learned? What can I be grateful for? Who can I talk to? Whose stories have I not listened to yet? Again, there's an elegance and power to simple truths that Intricate and complex misinformation can never possess. And so when Jesus says, Take my yoke upon you. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. He knows, just like he said before, that he brings a sword following Jesus might divide your family. Embracing your queer cousin might divide your family. Later on, he's going to say, take up your cross and follow me. Lose your life so you can find it. That's hard. Those difficult truths are not the only truths. In fact, they grow out of something much simpler. Love God, love neighbor as yourself, and with all that you are. May God make us strong in these simple truths. And may the things that grow out of them be beautiful and intricate and complex and wonderful. Amen. Now, as I understand it, this is the time for passing the peace. I hope you can continue this after the benediction. <laughs> which I will share with you at this time. We give you thanks, O God of compassion. You shoulder our burdens and ease the heaviness of our hearts. Give us the strength to carry each other as you have carried us and send us forth into the world to support the weak, help the afflicted, and honor all people rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.